Last week, beloved, we began, Smitty, a series of messages for the month of May entitled The Power of One. Let the whole church say the power of one. And beloved, this series seeks to look at what happens in our lives, Deacon Roz, when we develop the discipline to focus on one thing in life and not live a life that is fractured, frustrated, divided, and devoid of focus. Now, last week, Herschel, we looked at David, that sweet singer of Israel, the author, the writer of the majority of the 150 Psalms that makes up the hymn book of ancient Israel. And we listened in and looked at David as he writes in Psalm 27 and says these words, one thing. Let the whole church say one thing. Have I desired of the Lord, Lee, and that will I seek after. And Deacon Sylvia, we saw last week the power of one desire. Today, on this Mother's Day, I want us to look at the power of one determination. Paul, in the book of Philippians, puts it this way when writing what is uh, really Uncle George, Deacon George, our Mary Senior, what is really his autobiography. Because in Philippians, Paul talks about how he was circumcised the eighth day, how he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews of a significant tribe, how he was not only an observer of the law, but a keeper of the law. He goes through the litany, and, and I will say this, I will say this, I, I will say this. It is rather a uh, quite impressive resume. Now, uh, now you don't think much of it. You read Philippians chapter 2, chapter 3, and, and you read the various places in the epistles where Paul talks about his life and talks about his success and talks about his accomplishment, and you overlook it because most of it sounds rather, uh, how shall I say it, first century-ish. But what you need to know is that Paul was a big baller shot caller. Paul was somebody, y'all. Uh, if, if, if Paul were living today and, and write his resume, I'm going to look over here at Brother Steve Miller, uh, he would say that he was a member of Omega Psi Phi. But if he was looking over here, <laughs> Herschel, he'd say he was a member of the Kappas. Let me look over here because I got, I, got, I got Deacon Murdoch looking at me. He'd say he was an alpha. And then he'd go on and on and on extolling the virtues of his life. And is that Sister Mary sitting over there? And, and Mary, he would just give a litany of his accomplishments, his credentials, uh, his resume, his vita, the things he had accomplished in life. And, and Paul does that. And then he says these strange words. But those things that were gained to me, I count them, y'all ain't ready, it's early in the morning, rubbish, garbage for the excellency of the knowledge of knowing Christ Jesus. All the stuff I used to brag about and boast about and glory in, now that I am a follower of Christ that means more to me than anything else in the world. I wish I had a church here, Sister Helen. I guess I'm trying to tell you that you may build skyscrapers, grand and tall. You may build cathedrals, large or small. You may conquer all the failures of your past. Somebody old help me finish it, but only what you do for Christ, Tammy, is going to last. Only what you do 
Huh, I feel like preaching. Reverend Cynthia Mary, only what you do for him will be counted in the end. Only, somebody holler only. What you do for Christ will last. Paul says, I've got a pretty good resume, pretty impressive. It could get me in a lot of doors. I count all of that. I don't want to use the word this early. Dung. Look it up when you get home. <laughs> I count it dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, of knowing him. And then he talks about this marvelous pursuit. This one thing I do, <laughs> forgetting all of the stuff. Uh, huh. I do not know if I should say this. Forgetting all the stuff that is behind me, both good and bad. And, and, and can we be honest today, beloved, that, that one of the things that trips us up is our inability to let go a lot of us can let go of the good, you know. We humble ourselves, and I don't brag about that. But we struggle to let go of the good. But we struggle even more to let go of the bad. And we allow the devil to build a, it's like a mother-in-law room in the house of our lives. And move in and constantly remind us Dug of stuff that's in our past. Paul says, I forget all of it. This one thing I do, forgetting. Everybody say forgetting. forgetting. Things that are behind me, good or bad, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. I, I wish I had Bible reading. Of God that is in Christ, but Newsom, your dad would preach that. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. It, 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 is, it, is what, it is what one writer calls a magnificent obsession <laughs> to be gripped by one thing. I'm looking around, trying to figure out who in here. Let me look on Deacon Rosie Dowdy, you online. I wonder, Deacon Dowdy, is anybody online who's ever been gripped by some magnificent obsession? Something so great and grand and glorious Nothing else matters because you have become, I know obsession is a bad word. That's why the writer calls it a magnificent, a worthy obsession. I'll say this, since y'all not going to help me anyhow, I got to reach in my back pocket and pull out those amens I store for moments like this. <laughs> I, I, I know, I know, we, we you know, stalkers, Folk who are obsessed, that, that is not what I, it is a magnificent, an obsession worthwhile giving yourself to. Do you know anything of that today? Do you know anything of a goal, an aspiration so high, so holy that you give yourself fully and freely to it because it is your magnificent obsession. I'm going to say this, Chris, if I got to run out my own pulpit. You aren't, you aren't living until you get one. <sighs> if, if your life Preach, Clark. I'm doing the best I can with a hostile crowd. If your life is buckshot lived, if your life is diminished and diluted because you are here, there, everywhere, 
if your life is a mile long and an inch deep, I feel like preaching this. You will, you will live a long time, but you will never make a mark in this world. Can, can I argue my point today? Martin Luther King Jr. did not get to his 40th birthday, but what a mark he left. Malcolm did not make it to 50, but what a mark he left. Medgar Evers did not get to see 45, but what a mark he left. John Kennedy did never got to 50 years old. What a mark he left. My God, I think of people who were obsessed with some marvelous, magnificent obsession and they may not have lived long, but they lived well and their lives made a difference. Can I ask you this and you will not be mad at me? What if you live to be a hundred on the trajectory your life is currently on? When we bury you at a hundred, what will we say about you? Will we have, pastor, can I say it? Because you and I talk about this often. We have goo gobs of funerals here. And it bothers, pastor and I talk about, somebody lives 60, 70, 80 years, and they got, the obituary is four lines long. And we got to fill in the blanks. Lived all that time. Never made a mark. It is a magnificent, everybody say a magnificent obsession. It, it, is, it is to find something. I, I would wish for you today. I would wish for you today, as your pastor, I would wish for you, you would find. I would wish for you that you would, um, you would cut the dinghies from the ocean line of your life and sail out in the deep water. I would wish you would stop playing around the shore, sticking your toes in the sand, letting the water wash up ankle deep. I, I would wish you take a deep plunge into the wide ocean of God's providence and God's purposes and God's plan and swim sometimes trusting him because you do not know the, where the currents will take you but knowing the currents are under his control. God, I feel like preaching that today. To step out in faith. Take God at his word. You, you, DP, you can live a safe life, but you'll be bored. <laughs> Your life will be drab and dreary, and uh, it'll be kind of grayish. And, uh, but if you want bright colors, you, you've got to get off the beaten path. It, it is Deacon Dawkins, Deacon Gary. Was it Robert Frost who said, two roads converged? in the woods one day, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Jerry, you, you, you got to get off the beaten path sometime and make your own trail. Priscilla, it's what you did, city year, and what you did in city council, going where women aren't supposed to go. You got to cut your own trail. I um, was talking with someone, Priscilla, in great power in this city over lunch the other day. And we were talking about Les Brown and about Les Wright. Auntie Les. I, I told this person, everybody calls her Auntie Les. Lee, you remember uh, strategies against violence everywhere. <laughs> we should have kept that going, all this murder in this city. Somebody go get Auntie Les and bring her back here. Cut a path. Les Wright did. Cut a path. Les Brown did. Cut a path. The, the road 
I do not know who I'm preaching to. Just know this is not in the notes. It is, I believe, straight from God. You, if you're going to live a brave, bold life, you must find some magnificent obsession. Like, like Paul, you have to say this one thing I do. Nowhere, I, I'm through. Nowhere do we see this better exemplified, Deacon Sylvia. Your life shows it. Syl talks about her life, Deacon Sylvia talks about her life, single mother. She had us laugh. She had me laughing. She and I were talking privately. You should don't mind me telling. She said her mother would not watch her kids. She said, you made them, you take care of them. <laughs> and Sylvia said it made her become the woman she is. Because she had to work and take care of those kids, and she couldn't pawn them off on somebody. Y'all ain't, come on. Uh, somebody say magnificent obsession. And she rose from that. Single mother rose from it to become a vice president of a bank, a leader in this community, a deacon in this church. You can do it, but you got to find some magnificent obsession. Your life, my life, our lives must be lived with the words, with a Pauline philosophical bend. This one thing I do. Nowhere, Loretta, is this better exhibited, better displayed than in, on this Mother's Day, than in the life of this mother in Matthew chapter 15. Um, we are told she's a daughter, a woman of Canaan. So, so, some call her a cypher Phoenician woman, but that's such a hard word to say, I'm going to stick with Canaan. <laughs> she's a Syro Phoenician woman. She's a, she's a daughter. She's a woman of Canaan. I did some research on that. Uh, I looked it up in se several dictionaries, commentaries, uh, several atlases. I just was trying to be sure of something. And, and, and there, there's some disparity, some, you know, some lack of agreement. But most scholars agree that, that Canaan was most likely uh, in either the Middle East or what we would now call Africa. Okay, y'all ain't with me. I just said something, y'all didn't say nothing. Th this is a black woman. Okay, and I'm going to say this if I got to run out the room. She's a black woman with black mother love. And anybody here been raised by a black mama, you know ain't no love like black mother love. Now, it'll get you straight. It'll get you right. It'll beat you down, but then it'll pick you up. <laughs> ain't, no, ain't, you, ain't nothing like black mother love. Child, it'll take you almost to the brink of eternity and pray you back. said, oh, Lord, <laughs> oh, Lord, bring that child back. Black mother, Lord. she's no doubt a, a black mother. She, she's a Canaanite, a Syro-Phoenician woman. And, uh, and uh, she, uh, I, I, I noticed something, Lord, my phone keeps going off when I hit. Uh, okay, no. Yeah, hold on. There you go. Lord, I got to stop hitting with this hand or put the watch on this hand, one of the two. N notice, notice how this woman is treated by Jesus. Real quick. Look in verse 24. In, in verse 24, well, actually, verse 23, he ignores her. Yeah. Bible says a uh, woman comes to Jesus, and, and Jesus doesn't even answer her. He ignores her. Then in verse 24, he isolates her. He tells her, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You're not that. You're a Syrophoenician. You're a Canaanite woman. Will y'all allow me to say this? You're a black woman. Oh, Deacon Angie, they got quiet on me. You're a Syrophoenician. You're a Canaanite. You're black. I am sent to the lost sheep of the... He, he ignores her, then he isolates her, and then Jesus is on a roll, y'all, because in verse 26, he insults her. He calls her a dog. 
Verse 23, he, he, he ignores her. Verse 24, he isolates her. Verse 26, he insults her. But somebody holler, keep hanging in there. Because in verse 28, he's impressed by her. <laughs> here's my question. Next, the next 14 minutes, here's my question. What made this mommy... This woman, able and willing to endure the hurt and humiliation that she experienced. Where did she get this degree of determination from? And I believe the answer is in her singleness of focus. Y'all ready for it? She wanted her daughter delivered. I'm trying to give y'all a chance to preach. She... God help me. She wasn't trying to get her daughter in a school. She wasn't trying to get her daughter in a, in, in a social club. She wasn't trying to get her daughter in a sorority. She had one agenda item. She had one focus, one determination. My daughter needs to be delivered. God, I need help right here. And I'm going to say this, Pop Logan, if I got to run out my own pulpit, and there are a whole lot of mommies in Columbus, Ohio, in America and the world who need to adopt this sister's spirit and just say, I don't care what it takes, my child needs to be, my daughter needs to be delivered, my son needs to be saved, and whatever, okay, Whatever I have to do to bring that to pass, I am determined to do it. Here it is, three things I'm through. How did she get there? I'm glad you asked. Here's the first one. This mommy, this, this, this Canaanite woman, probably a black mother, recognized that she was the only hope her daughter had. Uncle George, my Mary, I don't want to go into it because if I do, y'all are going to miss your um, reservation at brunch. I don't want to go into it. Thank you, Uncle George. Uncle Deacon Murray said we need that. L listen, she, was, she recognized she was the only hope her daughter had. Nobody else was going to do this for her daughter. I want to say to every mommy in this room and every grandmother and every father and every grandfather, every uncle, every aunt, listen to me. For many of our children, we are the only hope they have. <laughs> now, I need, I need you to hear me. We cannot expect the systems of our society to save our children. We cannot, we cannot expect, we cannot expect law enforcement to do it. We cannot expect the judiciary or the legislature. We cannot expect the president or the governor or the mayor to do it. We cannot expect some outside force. There's no superhero that's going to fly into our community, sweep in, swoop down, and save our children. If our children are saved, it's going to be every last one of us sitting up here today who, like this Syrophoenician African black mama, says, I'm the only hope she has. I'm the only hope. I'm the only hope she has. I'm going to say this, Deacon Randall, and I, some of you may get mad. And I want to talk to my single mothers. You know I love every one of you. You know it. 41 years. I've never made you feel bad no matter what mistakes you made. I stood by you. Loved you. Treated your children the same. They called me Pop Pop and it didn't matter that I don't know who their daddy is. I have treated them the same. I've earned the right to say some stuff in this church. 
And I know you want to be married. I know you want companionship. I know you get lonely. But you can't bring every Tom, Dick, and Harry into your house and into your child's life. You are the only hope they have. If my daughter's going to be delivered, that mommy said, I'm the only one who's going to get to Jesus on her behalf. I need you to hear me this morning. I say it with love. You know I love you. I don't have to say it because you know it. I've shown it to you. Part of what's going to save this next generation is we got to get better. We got to get better. Three things, write these down, A, B, and C. Notice the concern she has for her daughter. She cares about her daughter. She's concerned, that's the first thing. B, she's, she cares about it. She shows her concern. I, Uncle George, I, I, there are members, in, I'm looking around because I want to be very mindful, very careful, John, very careful. Not to, not, I don't think anybody would be offended, but it's a sensitive matter. We have, we have parents in this church whose, whose children, whose daughters and sons um, are on the autism scale at various places. I watch them. I don't say much to them, Larry and Wanda, but I watch them and the concern they have and the care for children who are, in the words of my grandma, are more than a handful. If, if you've never raised a child with challenges, you do not know what it's like. I'm looking at you, Rennie, Priscilla, John behind you. John, your long battle with sickle cell anemia. In and out of hospitals. You've never been there. A child with a chronic illness, a debilitating disease. This daughter is severely, your grandson, severely demon possessed. Jackie, what must it have been like have a daughter who in any moment, Tony, any moment, the devil can have a rolling in this floor and breaking up stuff and tearing up furniture. Come on, church. I'm trying to preach where we live. And folk come to this church Sunday after Sunday and you walk by them because you're trying to get to me. And they're the ones who need a hug. They're the ones who need encouragement. They're the ones who need to know that they're part of a family because you don't know the hell they've been through all week long. Notice the concern. Notice the care. Here, see, and notice the cost she's willing to pay for the deliverance of her daughter. Well, here's the second thing. This woman recognized she was the only hope her daughter had. Secondly, she realized that Jesus was the only one that had the help her daughter needed. Ooh, that was good. I like that, and I wrote it. <laughs> no, no, no. This woman didn't just recognize she was the only hope her daughter had, but my Mary, she also realized Jesus was the only one that had the help that her daughter needed. Some texts say she was vexed with the devil. Some say she was possessed by the devil. Some say she was tormented by the devil. The um, New King James says she was severely possessed by the devil, by demons. Here's what we know, though. Jossie, here's what we know. This girl's problem was a spiritual malady, and so it called for a spiritual remedy. Ooh, I just said something. And that, that so well describes, does it not, the state of many of our children today. We see the fruit, but not the root. We see the results, but not the reason. We see the actions, but not the adversary behind the actions. C can I talk to y'all today? Come on, no, can I talk, Aunt D, can I talk to y'all today? 
who was it came to me? John, where's John? Where's John? Where did John go? Oh, John, John. Was it you that showed me on your phone, or was it Bill, about the murder? Which way was you? Bill, where was it? Drop your mask for a minute. Where, where was it? I thought it was here in Columbus. The one this morning, you said, not up there, in Clintonville or something. Was it Clintonville? Yeah, 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 in Clintonville. See, some of y'all don't know where Clintonville is because you, because you don't have near cousin living in Clintonville. Don't know, don't nobody in your tribe live in Clintonville. Bill said, he said, I'm putting on my jacket, get ready to come preach. He said, my God, they shooting people up in Clintonville. What you think? Did you think it was going to stay in Linden? Silly rabbit. Did you think it was going to stay on Mount Vernon and Long Street? Did you think it was going to stay on, on the hilltop? Violence is a spirit. And it may start one place. It's going to spread every place. You can't move that far away. This is a spiritual problem. We, we look at the gangs and the bullets and the guns. My God, y'all better look at the devil. You, you better look at what you've let your child become exposed to at five, six, seven years of age because now it's bearing fruit in their lives. Kevin, I know y'all mad at me, but you need to know I don't care. Somebody's got to cry loud and spare not. Somebody's got to preach to this generation. And I'm doing everything I can within my power, with my limited influence in this city, to advocate for, for more for, for more events and activities, for opening up, you know, these centers and uh, these rec places so kids can play basketball and they can die. I, but But I, I know even while I'm advocating, even while I'm on the phone, even while I'm meeting with the powers that be, I know in my heart that ain't going to solve it. The only thing that's going to turn this nation this state, this county, this city around is a move of God because the saints start praying. I got to go. I got to go because I, I feel y'all getting mad at me. Somebody holler, this is not a job for Superman. This is a job for the Holy Spirit. This is a job for the almighty God. I'm doing everything in my power. If you saw my schedule this week, you would see how many people I met with this week in power trying to head off a long, hot summer. Talk to our chief of police. We're praying for her. Talk to our mayor. We're praying for him. Herschel called me. And Herschel, you and I didn't finish, didn't get to talk, but I'm worried about that, this bill they pushing through. I'm doing everything I can with the with, with, with the the leveraging of influence from 41 years. But when I lead the meetings, I go to my study and I pray and I tell God, if you don't help us, if you don't help us, I wish I had a church here. If you don't, I know, I know what we just said, Lord, and I'm thankful the money's going to flow, and I'm glad we got projects, and I'm glad we've got plans, but if you don't help us, notice real quick, I have four minutes, her faith, A, was released in her determination. She goes to Jesus. Her faith is released. Her faith is recognized because Jesus says to her, great is your faith. I ain't never seen faith like this. And then her faith was rewarded. Be it unto you as you will. I believe God will do that for us today, beloved. 
I believe God will do that for us. If we release our faith, he'll recognize it. I believe he'll reward our faith. And I believe we can see things turn around. Here's the third. She resolved not to leave without her daughter being healed. Wow, wow, wow. I listened for a few minutes to uh, my younger brother in ministry, Dr. Otis Moss III, OM3. OM's been here, his dad, um, Dr. Moss, Pastor Moss, who we all love and I respect so highly, uh, has preached for us several times. Uh, OM was preaching at Trinity today in Chicago where he pastors. And I think he was preaching because when I got on, he was in the middle of the sermon. But from where he was preaching, I think he was preaching about those two mothers before Solomon who claimed the child was theirs because one child died. And, and he was arguing, as only O.M. the third can do, about how these women who are of ill repute got in front of the king in the first place. Because, you know, you don't just go to the Supreme Court. You got, to, you got to start downtown on High Street first. You don't just hop on a plane and go to Washington. You, you got to start on High Street and work your way up. And he was arguing, how did these two women of ill repute even get before the king? And he made a statement that just struck me. He said, all of us know that mother who will not take no for an answer. <laughs> right. Oh, God. I don't know why y'all pity patting, because that's the only way you got through school. Because she wouldn't take no for an answer. That's the only way you stayed out of jail. Because she wouldn't take no for an answer. That's the only way you still living and breathing. Even though you got caught up in some ridiculous living. Because you had a praying mother and a praying grandmother who would not take no for, tell a neighbor, she wouldn't take no for an answer. When life said you wasn't going to make it. When your family, your auntie said you wasn't going to make it. When all the cousins said you were, when your teachers said you couldn't learn, you were incorrigible. There was nothing to you. She wouldn't take, I, I need somebody on Mother's Day who is not so bougie that you can pop up right now and just give God thanks you had a mother who wouldn't take no for an answer. Oh, I feel that preach right there. No, I need somebody to just give God praise. When you were buck wild acting crazy, you had a mother who wouldn't take no, who wouldn't let you go, who wouldn't let the devil have you, who wouldn't let the devil destroy you, who looked the devil and hell in the face and told hell and the devil, you will not have my child, you will not have my children, you will not have their destiny, you will not have their purpose, uh, somebody holler, she wouldn't take no for an answer. That's what this woman did. She said, I don't care, you can ignore me, you can isolate me, you can insult me, but I'm leaving here with my daughter delivered. I wonder, do I have anybody at first church? Okay, I guess y'all want me to preach. Huh? After 41 years, y'all still want me to preach. Well, let's go ahead and preach then. Would you turn... Turn, turn to one of your neighbors and say, neighbor, I'm so glad she wouldn't take no for an answer. She said, you can insult me, you can ignore me, you can isolate me, but I'm going to stand right here until I get what I came for because I'm the only hope she has and you're the only one with the help she needs. And is there anybody here who can shout with me that when you stand and when you stick and when you persevere and when you pray, the Lord will hear your prayer, hear your cry, and so when you call, look at what this woman was subjected to. Look at what this woman suffered through. Look at what this woman sacrificed. Her humiliation, her embarrassment, the indignation of men treating her like that. But she took it all because she had one magnificent obsession. She wanted her daughter delivered. Is there anybody here that has a mama like that? If she's still living, if she's still sitting on the road with you, would you turn and say, thank you, mama, 
Uh-uh, I got to go, y'all. I'm going to do it. It's going to be a little rough. But if you sitting somewhere else and your mom is on the deacon board or your mom is an usher, get out your seat, run to your mama, and say, thank you, mama. Now, I need y'all to get up out of your seat, find your mama in this room, and say, thank you, mama. You prayed for me. You believed in me. You held on to God for me. And if your mom is gone, look up to heaven and holler, thank you. Mama, I'm in church today because you prayed for me. I'm saved today because you prayed for me. You didn't get to see it, but I'm in church now. Thank you, mama, for what you suffered, for what you sacrificed, for what you were subjected to. I see you over there where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are in rest over there where every day is Sunday. Sabbath has no end. Find your mama and say thank you.